Okay, we're going to be in Mark 6 again today, picking up where we left off a couple of weeks back. We got to miss last week due to weather, and uh, probably could have pulled it off, but it wouldn't have been very warm in here, and everybody would have been bundled up. I've seen them bundled up on a warm day. <laughs> I'm up here sweating, the all are covered up, and so... Um, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to get back on track with things. We've been looking at the book of Mark, and I wanted, I've, I've thought much about this this last week, and that's, as we have been looking at these last three chapters of Mark, the, the last three that we've looked at, it shows Jesus' compassion and how his compassion plays out in all of what he does in us, through us, for us, for others. I mean, that's love displayed. <laughs> how, mo how much more could you say? Um, and we all, we all have the responsibility of expressing that kind of love. He said, love one another as I have loved you. How did, how did he love us? Enough to go clear to the cross so that we would have that right relationship with him. If it means our life, it means our life. If we don't make it be very long on this earth as, a, as an active minister of the gospel, then it's because that's what God wanted us to do. It's, it means nothing. I mean, what's the worst that this world could do to us? Take our life. But that's the best thing that can happen to a Christian. Because our eyes will close in death and suddenly we'll be in the presence of the one we love. And so we need not fear that. Rather, we need to tell others about this and we've talked about this many times before how people don't want to hear it they don't want to hear it um Dinah do you remember the reference of those verses that you passed on to me on my phone because I want I would love to have you read them you didn't put you said uh, the book that they were in but that's all yeah I think I do um I've got my phone turned off so that it doesn't holler at me during church if anybody calls. But it, it displays the fact that even back in Old Testament times, people didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it at all. Uh, Katie, do you face that in Brazil? People that just, they don't want to hear it? Okay. I mean, it's not just here. I don't, I've never thought that it was just here. I mean, we see it here. We live in it here. Uh, Paul, John, you've both expressed it. Uh, but it doesn't change that responsibility. We have a responsibility to get God's word to the people. Whether they want to hear it or not. See... We've looked at this before in, in Ezekiel. It says that if that we've been made a watchman, and if we don't speak, God says to say something and we don't do it, and that person dies, we're in trouble. It was right in that same yeah. area. Yeah, yeah. And, and if it says, or if he, if he says and we speak, and they ignore it, then they're in trouble. That's chapter 33. That's, yeah, Ezekiel 33 is where that is. Can you find the text you sent to me the other day? I do have the text. That Just I read it. Just you. read the text. They it's, were the verses. It's probably 34. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not that important. The address isn't going to help that much. The, the building will. <laughs> it says, And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their lips. Though they are a rebellious house, 
you shall speak my words to them whether they hear or whether they refuse for they are rebellious but you son of man hear what I say to you do not be rebellious like that rebellious house open your mouth mouth and eat what I give you okay it, it. It, it was talking to in 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 Jeremiah it was talking to the was that Jeremiah in Jeremiah when he said I no it's in Ezekiel okay, okay. anyway it was talking to him about how he should go out and Everybody that was being work. spoken to Jeremiah, do you think? I, I don't know. I didn't have the reference. I could have looked it up. I didn't. I apologize. I got busy and didn't do it. Um, but it, it speaks to it. How many times have we talked about this here in church? That it doesn't matter whether they want to hear it or not. They need to hear it. They're going to have their own ways. They're going to say, well, I can get to heaven by being good. I can get to heaven. I mean, why wouldn't God let me into heaven? I mean, look at the kind of guy I am. And that's exactly the opposite of what gets you to heaven. The only thing that gets you to heaven is look how great of a God Jesus is. To have died for my sins and your sins. And we go to these people and we tell them, I know a way that you can be forgiven. Uh, Paul, you, you talked about it this morning, the, the, the um, conviction you can feel. I've had people tell me they don't want to come to church because when they do, they feel guilty. Well, then feel guilty. Stop doing what you're doing. What's making you guilty? That's what this whole last three chapters have been about in the book of Mark. God showing, and, and not just in himself, compassion, but he, he gave the, he gave the, uh, apost the disciples, he gave the disciples a charge to go out and talk and teach and do all sorts of miracles. And they came back rejoicing. Why? Because they knew what it meant to truly love. And until we get to the point where we love others properly, we will never, ever get it. We won't have compassion. Because compassion isn't just giving. Compassion International is an organization that gives. They've misused the word. And there's many others. Compassion is the outpouring of love and nothing more. And if we don't learn that love, we, we, we can't have compassion. Therefore, we can't be Christ-like. We can't be Christ-like and not have compassion on people. It will not happen. Okay. We got as far as verse 34 last time. That basically sealed the deal on the spiritual aspect now he's going to deal with the physical but it's going to show something about Christ a group of people were around him verse 35 says now the day was uh, the day was now when the day was now far spent his disciples came to him and said this is a deserted place and already the hour is late send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat okay. there's a there's an attempt on the disciples part to have compassion there's an attempt it's not really 
played out properly, but it's an attempt. And and for that, I don't ridicule them. They they did. I mean, they were thinking of others, and and that's good. That's kind of like an in route to be able to have a ministry with people, to get a hold of the idea that if I can reach into that life somehow and help that person be with that person, just maybe be a friend, then possibly I'll have an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. I can remember some of the toughest things that I've gone through in my life and people would sit down with me and they'd have to try to come up with the right word to say and I felt like just punching them. Don't say anything. Be my friend. I'd rather have you prove your friendship than to say something. See, that's how these people that are out here lost and hurting see it. I don't need you to say something. I need you to be my friend. Well, this is an opportunity to that regard. They wanted to go, wanted to, wanted Jesus to tell everybody to go home. Go away. Go into the towns and get something to eat. You're hungry. I know you're hungry. You haven't ate all day. I know it's not bad, not good English, but um, it is what it is. Okay, that's what they, what he was trying to get across to him, or they were trying to get across to him. Jesus answered and said to them. And this is where it gets kind of interesting. You give them something to eat. Now there's a, <laughs> a little hiccup in it. Well, we've been out here all day too. We don't have anything really either. How are we going to give you something when we don't even have something? Was Jesus passing the buck on them? No. Not at all. All he was doing was trying to get them to trust him. That's it. There's a big time spiritual application to this, although it is an outpouring of compassion in a way that only really Jesus could, and that's to make a little bit go a long ways. And I've heard people use this passage as a thing to talk about how, you know, uh, I don't have much money, but God made it blast me and I didn't run out before the end of the month. Well, there's non-Christians that do that too. <laughs> you know, that's not what this is talking about at all. That has nothing really to do with it. Okay? And he said to them, and they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? What's the obvious answer? No. I mean, that would... <laughs> You might as well send them away if you're going to do that. You might as well. But he said, how many loaves, he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Go see what you can come up with. Go see what you can come up with. The little bit that you have, I might be able to do something with. So go see what you've got. Go see. A whole pile of people standing around wondering what they're going to do for food. You ever been hungry? I would suggest to you, it could be hungry or thirsty, either one, when those two conditions, I don't care what else there is, those two conditions, hungry or thirsty, in this case they were hungry, that is an overpowering sensation that until it's quenched in some way will keep your mind focused on that. It just does. Finally, I get some food. Now I can eat. Okay, that's kind of the thing that he was working with here. Hungry people. Their mind was focused on that. Okay. How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said five loaves and two fishes. Now the thing is, it doesn't say how big the fish were. It doesn't matter. Okay, here's the point. Flannel graph stories show them about this big. I don't know if I believe that. 
That's hard for me to point out. I, I caught a fish that big. Uh, <laughs> I can't put my other arm up, so I'm not going to show you right. Um, but they, they show this pretty monstrous fish. It could have been little for all we know. It just says two fish. Why? Because that's not the big thing about it. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Don't get caught on that, please. Don't think that they were small. Don't think that they were big. The Bible doesn't tell us. If it wanted us to know, it would tell us. That's just how it is. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. Okay. That's a lot of people that he's going to be dealing with here. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up into heaven, blessed it, broke it, uh, broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. Okay. So now you have a supply of food that shouldn't even, I mean, unless they gave, he gave, if they were even a fish that big, divide that into six pieces, and it's not a very big piece. So he already did something pretty miraculous, I believe, just supplying the disciples with some food to give out. Now they had just come back recently, within a couple of days, come back from a trip going out into the world and giving, being taken care of, preaching, seeing God at work, doing miracles, all this that was going on. They'd just come back from that. So why in the world would they not understand what was going on here? Can God take care of that whole situation? You bet. Was he getting ready to preach prosperity theology? No. What does prosperity theology say? Well, I'm a child of God, so I deserve all the best. Tell that to South, to North Korea, to China. Try telling it to people in Afghanistan. Try telling it to people in Cambodia that don't. I mean, if they become a Christian, they're probably going to die. They're probably going to die, and it won't take long to have it happen. It's very hard to find a long-lived Christian in some of those countries because they just aren't there. He commanded them to sit down. They sat down in ranks. When he had taken the two fish and the uh, loaves and two fish, he broke it, gave it to his disciples. So they all ate and were filled. Okay, now we're going to get into what really matters with all this. This is what the, the crux of it all is. How many of you have all the answers? Biblically. Katie, you ought to. You're a missionary. Come on. You ought to. You're a pastor. We don't, do we? We have the little bit that we were given. Is this not the case? But they were willing to give what they had, and all were filled. He's told them before, you need to have the kind of compassion that I have. That's love displayed. You've got to have that. Now take this food and go give it to those people. What was he showing about himself? That the little bit that he gives us is more than enough to give to others. The problem is, the problem is when you deal with cults, when you deal with other religions, what they do, and, and I don't care who you are, these people walking around out here, even if they call themselves atheists, you know atheism is a religion? You know that? They say there's no God, but they push it. They push it. They're, it's a religion. It really is. We all will be dealing with people that are religious whether it's a, from a cult or a religion or whatever it happens to be everybody out there is that way okay 
whether they like to think they are or not. That tells me that they want to get to heaven their way. I don't care who it is. They want their way. I am religious. Therefore, it's what I do that matters. People that call me religious just drive me nuts. I hate it when they do. I want to just let it be known that I have a relationship. I'm a child of Jesus. He's my father. And I'll see him one day. So here I go, out into the world, and I've got this little bit of stuff. But what do they say? I, I tell them, well, Christ died for your sins, and he was buried, and he rose again. The next words out of their mouth are, yeah, but, yeah, but. every time. I've seen it time after time. Or, what about, there's the other one. And this goes on and on and on and on and on. And we get the idea that I have to know everything. They're going to come up with questions we can't answer on the spot. They do. Here's the problem. We don't need to try. But we try. And then all, all they do is say, well, yeah, see, I beat you down. You, you, you don't even know. You Get out of here. This has been my stance on it for many years now. Christ died for your sins like he did for mine. And he was buried to pay for those sins and he rose again victorious over those sins. And I don't have to stand guilty before him anymore. I watched that movie the other day, The Ten Commandments with uh, Charlton Heston. Yeah, yeah. And then the Pharaoh finally said, His God is God. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because our God is God. There is no other. Allah is baloney. Yeah. Buddha is a bunch of, you know what? Hey, our God is God. Here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If I tell somebody that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again, the first thing out of their mouth is always going to be a diversion. Every single time they will divert because they don't want to hear it. They want their own way to get to heaven. They're going to come to God their way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So we have the right. They have the wrong. And we're telling them what's right. What are they going to do? If I told you, if I had to, if I had to tell you, well, you... You're wrong in what, you know, I mean, you're going to automatically put up walls. Automatically. I don't care who you are, you put up walls. If somebody tries to tell you you're wrong for something, you put up walls. That's why people don't want to feel the guilt that they feel because sin is in their life. I want to self-justify and stand before God clean on my own self-justification. Therefore, I need to be able to do it. Okay? Then you have somebody like you or me that has this little bit of truth, even. A little bit of truth, and we take it to them. And they can be filled if they would just take that and eat it. Only. Instead, they say, well, I've got to do it my way. I've got to do it my way. Okay, that doesn't change what we have to offer. He's showing us in a real practical way, in a real practical way that we have nothing to lose by giving the gospel. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you are actually a Christian and your Christianity is based on nothing more than the fact that Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again, then you have more than enough to tell others. That's all we need. Now, how do I go about this? How do I go about this? I have somebody come into my life and I tell them Christ died for my sins. Yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't sin. I've had him tell me that. I don't sin at all. Liar. 
<laughs> Let's just call it what it is. You know, I mean, uh, just. But nonetheless, that's their idea. So how do we deal with it? They're sitting down in this group, we'll say, or standing around in a group of thousands, millions. There's, I think they're figuring eight billion people on Earth now. It's gone up a little bit. They're out there in this huge group of people saying, I'm going to heaven my way. Did you know the fastest growing church in California right now is the Church of Satan? I believe it. I'm not lying to you. I, I could show you statistics. I got my computer right there. I could hook it up and have it up and running in a matter of seconds and I could show you that the highest group of people that are being raised in this church, in this state alone are... It was the, founded in San Francisco. It was, it was, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I believe that it has a lot to do with um, the demonic activity out at Mount Shasta. I, I really do. I mean, you look into the stuff going on at Mount Shasta and you'll see it. Okay, we're in the middle of some pretty bad stuff right here. They're in a big old group of that type of people and we're saying, I know how you could be freed from your sin. But they don't want to hear it because then they'd have to admit that they sin. If I say I haven't sinned, I don't have to worry about that. Christ didn't die for my sins because I don't have any. I've self-justified everything I do away. I deserve to get angry. I deserve to drink alcohol. I deserve to, to do drugs. I deserve to say whatever I want to say. I deserve all this. I mean, look how people treat me. That's the kind of thing we're dealing with, Paul, I thought. Hey, uh, yeah. One time I really had an encounter with the enemy and his message, it's probably fairly universal. You know what he said to me? He said, if you do what I ask, I'll give you anything you want. Yeah. That's exactly what he said. Yeah. Well, well I could show you that that's a biblical thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's who he is. Yeah, I'm not making it up. I mean, oh, I'm not either. Yeah, and, and here's he the problem. The Here, here's the problem, Paul. You're not alone. You're not alone. Yeah. There are people out there listening to that. They do, and they get what they want. Okay, now here's the problem. The reward now. How much of that are they bringing with them when their eyes close Nothing. in death? None Nothing. of it. I recently, relatively recently, lost a cousin to cancer. And I saw a picture of her in her casket. She was wearing her tiara and stuff like that that I'm sure they buried her in, you know. Um, and, and that's fine. I'm not making fun of that. But all it's doing is going in the ground. You know, that's all it's doing. You, you don't said store for yourself treasures in heaven where, wrath, where rust, I always do that, where rust and moth can't destroy because every all the treasures that you have on earth they, they can come in and destroy I'm not going to say it perfectly because I'm not going to even try um, they'll come in and destroy but lay up your for yourself treasures in heaven where they can't that's what it's all about so we go out here into the world with this little morsel of something that could completely change their life Make them from starving to not starving. <laughs> from thirsty to not thirsty. That's all we have to do. The problem is we see success in the wrong eyes, with the wrong eyes. People look at success as how many, as even Christian, I mean, this is a big Christian thing. How many people have you brought to Christ? None. Well, then you're not successful. What do you mean? If I stand before God and He told me to tell somebody something and I told them, what's He going to tell me? Well done. Well done. It's not our job to save anybody, it's His job. So all we got to do, he, he doesn't tell us to do anything more than to go and teach, go and speak, do the work of an evangelist, and preach the gospel. 
That's what we're called to do. Wow! I can't save anybody. I've actually had people want me to. Right there. A guy, a, a lady, that you all, well, probably most all y'all, no, I don't know if Katie ever met her or not, stood right there and said, he, she used to call me pastor all the time. And she said, pastor, save me. I can't. I can take you to the one who can. That's what makes the difference. You aren't going to find that happening very often. I have worked with people in cults, like I say, I've said this many times, 40, probably 40 years or maybe even more now. No, probably even more because that was before, you've been here for 42, and it was before that that I ever started into that kind of thing. Um, and I don't know of any that I've brought to Christ. I don't know of any. But I know when I stand before God, or um, let me rephrase this, when they stand before God, they aren't going to be able to say, well, I didn't hear it. Well, they can say it, but they won't be right. Because <laughs> this old hillbilly from the backwoods isn't afraid to say it, <laughs> whether they believe it or not. And I don't make my determination on whether I'm doing good as a pastor or not by how many people I've brought to Christ. Would it be great to chalk some up? Yeah, that'd be, I'd, I'd be happy. Who wouldn't? I mean, is it somebody reaching out to people? And, is, yeah, you want that to happen. But here's the problem. If that's the route on which I base my success as a believer, I'm going to fall short, I'll quit, and I'll, I'll just give up. But I've got to get it through my head that it doesn't matter what they say. It's my job to tell them. If they don't like to hear it, that's on them. It's no, all it has to do is come out of my mouth. And I've done my job. And I'm not doing it so that God will go, good job, Jerry. I'm doing it because I care about those people. See, that right there is what I'm trying to... I'm not saying I've got that down. Don't get me wrong. I don't have it down yet. I'm trying. But that's love enacted through compassion. That's what Jesus did all the way through this. He was moved with compassion. And he did things. That's what the book of Mark is all about. That's all it's about is Jesus showing his compassion on people. And he did it willingly. Did everybody he dealt with follow him explicitly? Not at all. He had but a few, really. So why should I expect I'll do any better? I, I don't. He had it down. I don't. Why would I gauge my success on a tougher scale than Jesus gauged his? He did what his father told him to do. Well, am I doing what my father told me to do? I better be. Okay, now we got seven minutes. Let, let's finish this up. Because there's one more neat thing. Um, so they all ate and were filled. Verse 43 says, And they took up twelve baskets of fragments. Um, uh, and... Of fragments and of the fish of those who had eaten of those were about 5,000 men and immediately he, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida well what does it say he did well he sent the multitude away when he had sent them away he departed to a mountain to the mountain to pray can I suggest this? If we're not active in the ministry, we're not praying properly. We're praying for stuff, not for hearts. Joel Osteen. Okay, yeah. Smiling Joel's good at that, isn't he? Uh, there's all these that, that are just down that that line of thought. If we aren't doing what we're supposed to be doing and if we aren't praying 
for them were praying for stuff. Now, you can look in that bulletin. There's always Wednesday night prayer requests kind of lumped together because, if, I mean, sometimes it'd take a lot to type them all out. You'd need two or three pages. But how many of them are stuff? <laughs> how many of them are for salvation? And you don't see it properly in the bulletin because Dad pretty much has to write for those in need of salvation and that takes care of a lump of them. So I would encourage you, if you can do it, to be here on Wednesday night. You'll see what we're talking about. When we bring out these prayer requests, praying for David's friends that need salvation, for people I know or Diana knows or or people that mom knows that, that need salvation. We're bringing them up from time to time. Rather frequently. Now does that mean God doesn't care about the other stuff? No. Not at all. He wants us to be okay. But that's not a priority to him. He wants us to be spiritually fit. How many of you work out or ever have worked out? I've, I've kind of let myself go a little since my military days. I admit that. <coughs> Excuse me. But here's the thing. <coughs> when you work out, you eat. If you don't eat and you work out, you get sick. And you're weak. And you stumble. And things go wrong. Okay, That's just how it is. What about spiritually? When do we work out? When we work out, we're out there telling others, but if we aren't eating, so to speak, the Word of God, we're going to get weak. David said it this way, it's sweeter to me than honey. And I would eat of the Word of God daily. He says, on your law, I meditate day and night. See, there's a reason why we need to be so-called eating it. What happens to the food you eat? It becomes who you are, basically. I can remember when I was a kid, everybody used to say, you are what you eat. And then they'd tell me how you ate something disgusting, you know. They're just being mean, but, you know, I mean, it, it was fun. I used to do it to people, too. But in, fact, in reality, that's true. I consist of the things, basically, that I consume. So if I'm consuming the Word of God and it's becoming me, then I have strength. Otherwise I don't. And then I can take that and go out into the world and I have something to offer. Who is this designed to reach here? An elite few? When I was in Endicott pastoring there, the church told me very explicitly that it's not my job, or it's not. <coughs> they said it this way, it's not my job to go out and reach the community, it's yours. That's what they told me. I had a pastor that I grew up under, Lyle Berkey, wanted to come over and help out with the team of guys. They said, yeah, they can come over and do something, but we're not, I mean... We're not putting them up. We're not doing anything. They, there's a motel in Colfax. If they can get a room there, then that's fine. No interest. Who is this designed for? You. You. Me, too. But if I talk to me, <laughs> I'm, like, going to get acorns thrown at me out there. <laughs> try not to talk to myself but it's it's for us we've got to get this down that we need that kind of compassion where we'll be the kind of guy that'll take that little morsel of bread and take it to somebody who's hungry and give it to them well, I don't feel hungry doesn't matter eat He 
he went to the mountain to pray. Why? Because we need to have communication with the Father. When I was in the army, we had all sorts of gear that we used, including weapons. But one of the things that I wanted more than anything else should I have had to go into combat was a radio so I could be in communication with other people. The spiritual armor covers your head, your feet, your waist, your chest, everything that you need, a shield, all the stuff you need. But everybody stops with that. One of the most important ones is the next one after all of what they normally include, and that's prayer. It's prayer. And I need people to pray for me, and I need to be praying for you. And we, we used to have in our bulletins two church families to pray for. And we've long since quit that. We had one missionary to pray for, and we've long since quit that. And here's the reason why. Because I need to be praying for all of you, not just um, Terry and Gloria, or Terry and Roberta and Gloria, for example, or Dolly and, and Ruby, the two alphabetical names. But if it says, pray, remember to pray for the church families, who is that? The group. And I want you to remember to pray for me, because I'm part of that group. And if you think it's easy being me, come do it. Come do it. I, I'll, I'll prove to you it's not. You better watch it. Somebody will try. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, there's a story to that that we could talk about oh, later. Oh, okay. Um, here's the thing. It's no harder for me to be me than it is for you to be you. And so we'll if you're struggling and I'm struggling and we both know who can help us with it, why would we not pray for one another? Amen. You know, we need to. I mean, that's the crux of the whole thing. If I'm going to be out ministering to people, I need people to pray for me. If you're going to do it, I need to be praying for you. You're down there all the time doing it. You're running around the United States doing it. You're all over the place doing it. Why? Because you... That's you. you. It's become you. And we need to be praying about that. Not just on the days when we have a letter to read here at the church. But I suggest more so on the days we don't. Sometimes the reason why we might not hear something from somebody is because they're having a hard time. There's a lot of missionaries we don't hear much from. Well, we need to be praying for those missionaries. We're out of time. I, I never enough time. Never enough time. Terry. There's one group I think we're forgetting, and I think it's because we don't feel capable. Uh -huh. Was it Matthew 28 to go into the world and what? Make disciples. I'll preach the gospel, yeah. And make disciples. Whoa. Yeah. I don't see that happening. But I it's see so that's rare. Not my job. Yeah. It's somebody else's job. I'm just gonna preach the gospel. I don't wanna it's basically I think they're they don't think they're capable of making disciples and teaching them. It requires I eat the food. Yeah. <laughs> it I requires I eat I, I think there's that you know, we're talking about people I don't wanna hear the gospel. The ones who do hear the gospel and accept it, go on your way, be yeah. filled, yeah. have a good day. Now that God's in you, great. Yeah. I just chalked another one up. Look how cool I am. I've made another convert. Yeah. No. We're not. I mean, that's just not how it works. And Terry, that does bring up a good point. I mean, I, there again, I wish we had all morning. Katie would be mad at me, and I'm not ready to get her mad at me. She's a good example. You know, I don't know how many she shared the gospel with, 
but she's also in the teaching mode. Too. Of course, of course. And that's that's a part that we sort of like. That's somebody else's job. The well, teachers will do that. If know? I yeah. if I would only, you know, Pastor Doyle said it this way. Uh, you mo most of you know nothing of Pastor Doyle other than what I've told you, but. He was one of my strongest mentors and somebody that I've looked up to my whole time of knowing him because of his severe wisdom and taking me <coughs> under his wing. And he's told me this. He said, don't try to do it on your own. Don't try to do it on your own. Take what you have that God gives you while you're reading your Bible, while you're studying your Bible, just daily or whatever. Use that. And it's helped out. There's been times like Dad had to go off on an emergency call Sunday morning, and I've got 45 minutes to put something together for church. If I wasn't in God's Word, I would not be able to do that. I'm not bragging. I'm only giving an example. That's all it is. I, boy, see, now you get me going again. <laughs> I've got to shut up. I, I, oh, come back next week for part two, please, Katie. We're on YouTube, I promise you. <laughs> Let's pray, though. Lord, thank you for your love. Your love that brought you to the sinful earth to die so that we could live. Help us to have that kind of love. Help us to express that love as you express that love. Help us to be Christ-like. More like the Master. Help us, Lord, in this lost world to be in a shining light and an example of what you are. Thank you for it in your name. Amen.